You're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 162. We sell something to someone every day, even if it's just ourselves. Attention, gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and guess what? It is two weeks away from the publishing date of my book. I am so excited to present to you Maker to Master in just a couple of weeks, and If you haven't taken advantage of this opportunity already, I want to remind you all that you have a chance to get my book for free. No gimmicks, no nothing, truly for free. If you're interested in being on the list to find out how you can do that, go over to giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash free book. Now let's get on to the show. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Bob Hurley of Hurley 45. Bob's company helps businesses grow their sales through major retailers. Do you have a vision of seeing your product on the shelves in one of the big brand stores? Maybe even a box store. Bob finds that many people want to jump in without truly understanding the intricacies that they will encounter. By nature of their size, Large organizations that you might want to be in have a lot of requirements. Financial, logistics, testing, vendor contracts, pricing, supply chain management, private label initiatives, replenishment are just a few. Oh my gosh, and I'm already exhausted reading that list. (laughs) It's important to have that dream of selling big, but not without the adequate preparation. Bob advises that you should have a strategic plan for growth, not an impulsive plan for growth. I know we are all going to learn so much in talking with Bob. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Sue. I'm excited about this. So I do kind of a crazy intro, as you know. For us to get to know you in a little bit of a different way, I'd like you to describe yourself through a motivational candle. So if you were to tell me a color and a quote that would describe you as a motivational candle, what would it look like? It's so funny that this is your first question because just an hour and a half ago, I was consulting with a candle company in Dallas. No way. (laughs) (laughs) We were talking fragrances and vessels and all sorts of stuff. It it was really interesting. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. (laughs) But I think, and I've got this quote hanging in my bathroom wall, and it's by Shakespeare, and it says, to thine own self be true. And I think that that is such a personal quote that reflects to the world of who you are. And if you can live it and portray it through your actions and deeds, then you truly are your own motivational candle. I would see this as kind of maybe an ivory type candle with some sort of sculpting to it and a rich, deep fragrance like mahogany or sagewood or smoke, just something really earthy and nothing pretentious. That would be a candle I would want there, Bob. That's good. I like (laughs) that. (laughs) And your quote, to thine own self be true. I think a lot of people these days are getting themselves all confused because of what we're seeing on social media. Everyone's presenting that their life and their business is all perfect and they've got everything together. Right. And when you dig down, you see that that's so far from the truth. So just to be genuine and be, like you said, to thine own self be true gives you some sanity that not everyone's perfect. It's just be truthful. Be who you are. Exactly. And enjoy the fun of the ups and downs and twists and turns that life takes you. Yeah, it can be hard when you're in the middle of it. I think it's a perspective, though. Exactly. Well, you and I have known each other, I don't know, when did we meet? Five years ago? Something like that? Maybe more? I really don't even remember. But I don't know that I know your whole backstory. So 
bring me and the guests up to speed and tell me also something I don't know, something fun, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fun part is I just took a beekeeping school class two weeks ago in Central Texas. So I'm wanting to learn how to start my own beehives. I have no idea why, but it just sounds like it's good for the planet, good for everybody involved, and it's almost relaxing. It's that one thing where you can unplug and just do. So do you have one of those suits yet that I see on TV? Not yet, although I have suited up and I did not get stung. So I'm batting 100 right now. Oh, boy. <laughs> this is going to be a conversation we are going to continue. <laughs> I got to see how this goes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. So let's talk about your business, too. How did all this come about, Hurley 45? I started right out of high school in retail, as most everyone does. I started with Sears back in the early 80s, and that was back when Sears had the slogan, Satisfaction Guaranteed or Your Money Back, and they had tremendous, wonderful people working there. Customer service was job one. One of my favorite quotes that was hanging in the buying office that I worked in was, at Sears, we sell something to someone every day, even if it's just ourselves. And I've carried that with me for 30 plus years now. And we're all in sales. Sometimes we sell products. Sometimes we just sell who we are. And I think that kind of goes back to my quote, thine own self be true. At Sears, I started as a district buyer or replenisher. And then as Sears started to organize and push everything to Chicago, they closed down the district offices. So I went to the regional buying office and bought products for the stores, tires, candy, sporting goods. It was such a great experience. I stayed with Sears through the late 90s. There were 15 plus years. Sears had really taken some changes and some drastic turns trying to stay relevant. And they were no longer the company that I identified with. So I left Sears. I went to work for a temp agency. And the very first assignment they sent me was to work for a sales rep agency here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And Randy Putnam and Associates was an amazing experience for me. I took everything that I had learned from Sears on the retail side and applied it to manufacturers on how to sell their product to the retailers. And that was such an incredible building for me that I was with Randy and his team for 15 years. And in 2010, I stepped out on my own and started working with companies in Asia. I worked with companies in China and Mexico and worked with domestic manufacturers and designers. And now I'm working with companies out of Europe. So I'm really helping companies throughout the world try to identify their brand, their strengths, and pursue their goals of getting product placed in the various retailers. And so are you traveling internationally a lot now too? A little bit, yes. But you can do so much with Skype that we're on right now while we're recording. You can do so much. Exactly, yes. Technology has made this industry so much more efficient. Completely, because you don't have to spend a day or two getting somewhere to see somebody every time you want to talk with them. Yes, and you no longer have to fax orders. <laughs> oh my gosh, the fax. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, crazy. Well, I love the fact that you've worked both sides because you really can understand and be sympathetic from a retail end. Because also some of our listeners have shops, they have gift shops, and they're looking to place products. So they're buying. Yes. But the real conversation that I want to do today is people who are making something who are interested in getting it into a shop, you know, a larger store. Some of them might have their products shown in a couple of local boutique type shops, but not some of these bigger stores. Yes. And I do know from a little bit of experience, but mostly from talking to you and some of my past experience, it's a whole different ball game. So I think understanding the true picture of what that's all about, not everything, but overall and how it's so different, I think will be really beneficial. And gift biz listeners, I want you to think about this as we're talking because it might readjust your vision. If this is something that you're thinking about, you may then say, 
yes, this is exactly the way I want to go. Or you might say, you know what, hands off, not necessarily for me. I might want to put it on the side, investigate it later, or it's not really what I want to do. So that's the kind of resolution I want to get to with all of this conversation, Bob. Yes. Let's start with just some overall, if someone has a product and they're considering putting it into some of these larger stores, what's some of the thought process that they should be going through? Well, the first thing you need to consider is how many stores does chain A or retailer A have? Suppose they have 150, 200 stores and you're manufacturing candle for lack of other product and you offer this candle in three different jars and four different colors with three different fragrances in order to supply 200 stores all of a sudden you're having to be able to manufacture within a reasonable amount of time it could be 2,000 pieces that needs to be manufactured and shipped within 30 60 90 days Okay, this is a good point, first of all. If you're still making your product yourself without going through a manufacturer, this is probably not a place where you can play yet, right? Right. You need a high-value manufacturer. Yes. When you're talking, you're using your example of 200 stores. Do you have to approach a company with the feeling that you're going to get in every single store, or do you have the option of doing something more in those stores on a regional basis, for example? It depends on the retailer and type of retailer. Most stores of that size have what they call a standard basic assortment or they're buying seasonally that goes to all stores. Only the real large chains can distribute by store location or geographic location. So in the smaller, the mid-sized retailers, the 100 to 300 store chains, you're probably selling to the entire chain. What I'm hearing you saying is it's a distribution issue because a lot of these larger retailers have distribution facilities where you're shipping the product to a certain facility and then they're sending it out to the stores. Exactly. They're just cross-stocking it and shipping it direct to store. All right. So first point is based on the number of stores and then the number of SKUs you have. And it doesn't mean that a retailer is going to accept all your SKUs either, right? They may only take one or two, especially when they're testing and seeing if they're interested. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So number of stores is something to consider. What else? Well, the financial part of it. So again, if retailer A buys four of your candles per store and you have to build a thousand candles, all of a sudden you've got to have that money to buy the raw goods, have the labor to produce it, and you've got to pay those people by the hour. Then you ship it and the retailer typically does not pay until 30 or 60 days what they call ROG, which is receipt of goods. So if you ship it on August 1st and they receive it August 15th, they don't pay you typically till 30 to 60 days after August 15th. And even then, the time of processing that check after September 15th, it could be another 10 to 15 working days. So you're carrying the financial burden for a good 180 days before you get paid. Yeah, for quite a while, for sure. You're making it and because they can't buy it unless it's already made. And I'm imagining, Bob, also you have to show that you have enough in stock. If they blow off the shelves, they're going to want to restock it pretty quickly. So you've got to have supply probably over and above what they've even purchased. They don't want to wait for a turnaround. Very much so. And most everyone can acquire financing, but you have to get the right financing so not all your profit is taken up in finance charges. Oh, good point. Yeah. And you have to build that into your cost. I think that a lot of people look at doing this in the first place because they say, oh my gosh, big volume, big revenue, right? Yes. Talk a little bit about pricing of the product and what larger chains are requiring and from my experience, demanding <laughs> of what the <laughs> right. prices should look like. What happens if you're selling a candle, let's say locally, 
for, I don't know, $10 or something like that, and your cost is five, let's just go with a traditional markup like that. What are these larger stores on average? I mean, everyone's different, I know, but what's a realistic idea of how the numbers would fall? Well, and again, you have to look at the perceived value. The price that the consumer is willing to pay at a boutique is they're willing to pay a little bit higher price than, say, at a Kohl's or Steinmart or Walmart or Michael's, whomever. So like a candle that may sell for $20 at your local Hallmark store, the perceived value at a Michael's or somewhere else could be a good 20% less because it is a mass retailer. When you go to Walmart, you expect lower prices. Right. So let's say, let's use your 20 example. They would be looking at selling that at what? 15, 16, 20% thing? You know, 14 to $16. Okay, so 14 to $16. And then half of that is what they will pay you for it, probably? No. If you can get a 50% margin out of them, you've got an incredible product. Oh, so what are we <laughs> looking at here? See you guys, this is the stuff we need to know. A lot of retailers are looking for minimum 55% margin all the way up to, and don't scream when I say this, is 75 to 78% margin. Again, it depends on the product category. When you step into a retailer, nine times out of 10, let's throw Michaels out, for example, an item that sells for $19.99. Most everybody knows that Michaels has a 40% off coupon. So if that item's not on sale, that consumer is going to use that 40% off coupon. And boom, right there, they're paying $12 for it. Right. So if Michael's cost on that item was $10, then all of a sudden they're only making $2 per item. So their margin expectations is much greater because they have these the advertising expenses. They're having to put items on sale in order to get the consumer into the stores where your local boutique isn't having to do that. And if they are putting it on sale, they're marking off 20% and they're still making a decent margin. Right. Because again, using this example, at a retailer, let's say a candle for $20, you've probably wholesaled it to them for $10. i am just using just general standards here, right? Exactly. And so you're not supplying as much, they're not buying as much or selling as much, but your margin on those could be so much greater than being in these big chain stores. So it's really something to think about. I'll turn that back around then, Bob. Why would anybody want to do that? We're going to hear Bob's answer after a brief word from our sponsor. This podcast is made possible thanks to the support of the Ribbon Print Company. Create custom ribbons right in your store or craft studio in seconds. Visit theribbonprintcompany.com for more information. It's all about volume. And one of the first lessons that I learned is you put dollars in the bank, not percentages. And if you're selling a million units and you're only making 10 cents per unit, that's quite a few dollars that you're putting in the bank. Versus if you're selling 100,000 units and making 12, 15 cents per unit. The trick is that you're still making, that you're not selling your product out to be in a big store, but you're actually losing money and making it. Right. So it all goes back in that way to production costs. Yes. So that's a big thing to think about, <laughs> right? It's huge. Yeah. But don't let that be a discouragement. Let it be your inspiration to work through, not to be afraid of. Everything that we talk about, let this be a learning and not something to intimidate. Right. A learning to understand the situation because I could see yes. some people, if they're interested, okay, now they understand, I've really got to get my price down. I've got to be working with my manufacturers or doing something with materials to get my product costs down in some way if they want to position themselves to be able to go into the larger stores. Yes. Okay. Talk a little bit. We talked about financial, logistical a little bit, pricing. I don't want to get into some of these others too much, but let's talk about testing. If you go in, and I've been in some of those buying offices before, tell everybody that that would be an interesting thing to talk through. Tell everybody what to expect. So if they have a candle, let's stick with that. One of my favorite products in the whole world, which is why we started the interview <laughs> that way. 
and I really like your sandalwood candle. <laughs> So someone has candles and they've listened to this and they've gotten their production costs down. They aren't making them out of their house anymore. They have somebody who is producing their original candle scent and form and all of that. So now they're looking at going into, let's go with Michael's. What are the steps that they take? How does it happen from, okay, I have this idea. I've heard this. I think I'm prepared because Bob told me what to do. Uh -huh. initially, what happens next? Okay, so in respect to testing, everyone can remember 20 years ago when candles would have lead wick with cotton fiber around it, and no one wants to burn lead and be exposed to lead fumes and all that. So Consumer Product Safety Administration has stepped in. California has been so instrumental in protecting the consumer from inadequate product, like on a candle. One thing they test is burn time to make sure that what you say your burn time is is going to be what the consumer can expect. They inspect to make sure that the glass is not going to break while it's being burned, that it is heat appropriate to the flame. The contents of your wax, the quality of your wick, there's so many things. They even look at how it's labeled to make sure that there's no misleading information whether it's toys or pillowcases or clothing or jewelry, there's always testing for lead and things like that. When you work with a retailer that is in multiple states, that has multiple locations, 200 plus more locations, their liability for putting in a bad product that can harm someone, it's incredible. Oh, it's huge. I can only imagine. Like I think of the old Tylenol scares. Or some of the baby car seat safety issues there have been. Because mm -hmm. it's not the worst part is if someone gets injured, but then it's the reputation for the whole chain, the whole name. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So do you go in having all of your documentation that all everything's been tested? You try and cover that as much as you can before you see them. It's best to be able to qualify what you're claiming on your product is indeed true and not harmful. Okay, so that's what all the testing is about. Yes. Okay, so let's pretend like we're in a buyer's office, okay? We've got our candles now, and we're going to be sitting down and meeting with a buyer. How do those meetings go? It's the very first one. It's all introductory. It's conversational. A lot of people like to have a very show their catalog and things like that. It depends upon the buyer, but... You definitely want to tell them who you are, how long you've been in business, your vision. One thing that buyers are now asking is, what is your social media impact? How are you able to help drive consumers into the stores to help sell your product? That's always one question. So you have to have a Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Etsy statement. And so they're going to want to know the number of followers. Even though we all know that that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but they want to know. They do. They want to know, again, about your supply chain. Can you indeed, if I provide you with an initial order and a reorder every 30 days that you can fulfill it? They want to know about your design capabilities. Are you just a one-hit wonder or are you constantly reworking and redesigning your product to stay relevant for the next season? Oh, yeah, because I'm sure they have a lot of people coming to them. And once you're an approved vendor, I'm sure that's a process of getting through all of that, reviewing the testing and everything. So they'd rather work with fewer people, I would think, that they can continue doing business with bringing in new products than replacing you because you didn't have an Easter line, let's say. <laughs> exactly. And it's all about that partnership. Everyone wants to have that vendor partner that they can go to and say, okay, here's the project for now. How can you enact it and, and roll it out? What about private labeling? Private labeling is becoming, so there can be a lack of product differentiation almost in the world of sourcing and visibility to product. The world almost seems flat. And what I mean by that is every retailer is watching Pinterest. So if you've got 200,000 followers on your Pinterest page, odds are 
the retailers are looking at what you're doing as well as your competitors and everybody else. So manufacturers are looking at it. It has amazing visibility beyond what you're taking into consideration. So when I go on a sourcing trip, like to the Canton Fair in China, I can go from one showroom to the next, to the next, to the next, and see almost virtually the same product in every showroom. You know, everyone's following the same Pantone color trends, When Chevron hit four years ago, everyone had Chevron. So that's what I mean when the retail world can almost be flat when it comes to sourcing product, because when one rolls out with it, everyone has it. From the same vendor? Even multiple vendors. I mean, oh my goodness. Because everyone's producing something similar because they know it's a hit. Yes, exactly. So what then about private label? Like if someone's making candles... Let's say Michael branded a candle that was their own. And I know, I think Michael's has a private ribbon brand, right? They have, I think, six different private labels. And Hobby Lobby has their own private label and AC Moore. Is that something to get into as a designer? It is. Although, like when you go to the grocery store, you can buy Green Giant green beans and they're $1.49. You can buy the signature brand private label and it's $1.29. So in private label, there is a little bit of a cost, less cost associated with it. Unless of course it has the Neiman Marcus brand on it, but (laughs) that's a whole other story there. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. (laughs) But most every retailer does have a private label initiative. It's becoming so easy to source from overseas. And I'll take a product called Cricut. It's a die cutting machine that is used in the craft industry. A lot of our listeners know exactly what that is. So this is a perfect example. So all the retailers carry it and all the prices are pretty much controlled. You very seldom find it on sale less than a threshold price. But by a retailer being able to private label something, That gives them a product. It's the same product, but it's differentiated so that they can offer more promotions and drive the consumer specifically to that brand, to their own product. What is the attitude of American made then? I mean, you're doing so much overseas and obviously the cost coming in, Mm -hmm. at least now you can get things made so much less expensively. What's the value of it being American made? What are the larger companies feeling about that? So Walmart four years ago had, and they still push American made product. I would like to ask your audience to think to themselves, okay, what value does American made mean to me in their own purchasing? Do they typically seek out made in America versus made anywhere else? And I would have to say nine times out of 10, it's more of an afterthought and it's probably driven more towards a more expensive type brand, possibly automotive, things of that type of investment. As far as like, again, a candle, I don't think many people will turn over to the bottom of the candle and say, oh, that's made in Vietnam. I'm not going to buy it. If they're in a larger store, probably. Right. If you're in a craft show, you are, but that's a whole different thing because then you're actually talking to the creator of those products. Exactly. Yes. You almost can look at products sold in the larger stores, the big volume play as a totally different product than ones that are made through artisans, still handmade or even handmade, but through a manufacturer or something. Very much so. Definitely. I think that's an important differentiator here. Yes. I would have to say that there is a made in China fatigue. And it kind of goes back to an example that I was painting earlier that so much of the product made in China all has the same look. The chevrons, for example, everything out of China was so heavy in chevrons. I do see retailers looking for a more global view. And when you look at successes like World Market, you can find a more varied approach to product and you see product out of Europe, 
in other countries beyond just China that allowed the consumer to be more expressive in their purchases. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I wonder if they'll change around. Right. It'll be interesting to see, I think. You and I met at the Craft and Hobby show. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first show we saw each other at. Yes. When you're going to shows, what are you doing there? What are you doing there, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> and let me explain for the listener. So Craft and Hobby Show will have a number of people showing, obviously, in our genre, crafts, exactly what it says. But so there'll be small, medium, and large vendors there. And a lot of these larger stores are coming. And local manufacturers and vendors and international. And international, you're right. Yeah. So I go back to my question. What are you doing there? I work with, at any given show, I'm probably working with anywhere from four to probably 10 different manufacturers at those shows. Are they at their shows as an exhibitor? As an exhibitor. Got it. Okay. And I'm helping them sell their product to the retailers. I have buyer's appointments scheduled with various booths with the various retailers that their product pertains to. But I'm also looking at trend and new items and energy levels and kind of the pulse of the industries. Oh, that's interesting. I was at the Chicago Houseware Show two weeks ago. And you didn't come say hi? I know. It was so cold, though. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is not an excuse. <laughs> I'll forgive you this time. It was such a different vibe and energy level from the craft and hobby and completely different industries, yet I'm using the same skill sets, but it's a different approach. Yeah, that's interesting because you're talking about the vibes of the shows in terms of possibly whether the overall topic is a hot topic right now, right? Yes. And I'll stay with craft and hobby because that's the one I know better when we've been together and probably which booths people are most attracted to, not just for the big retailers that you're working with, but where are the other businesses going? Because they may have a clue as to what's coming up and what's hot. Some of these small and medium-sized businesses. These are not consumer shows, by the way, gift biz listeners. These are business-to-business -business shows. People are going to find product that they're going to stock in their stores. So that's interesting. I didn't think about that. It's a really good place to learn if you're going to a show, either as an exhibitor or an attendee, is what looks to be the biggest attractions in the exhibit area. Right. Like craft and hobby show, as you've witnessed for the past 15 years, paper crafting has been the driving force behind it. it started with scrapbooking into card making and mixed media and now you're starting to see the mixed media element take over where wood surfaces and painting and embellishment in, in your ribbon business, how ribbons being used not just to adorn packaging or for clothing, but it's being used on pictures and in mixed media applications. And it's being driven through Pinterest and Etsy. You've got these independents just putting it all out there. Right. Reinforcing. Yes. That is interesting. And you're right. I have seen a big difference with the paper. So stationary show, same thing. Very much so. Things are changing. But I have to say my most favorite show was the fancy food show. Oh, yeah. Are you coming to Chicago? <laughs> are you coming back to Chicago, Bob? <laughs> That's next. <laughs> oh, gosh. And do you have clients to be at the fancy food shows? Yes. So one point that I wanted to talk to your listeners about is... Retail is an ever-changing, ebb-and-flow environment. What made sense 20 years ago? I mean, my goodness, Toys R Us was the leader in toys 20 years ago, and look at them now. Yeah. There's so many other ways to sell your product to get you ready to get into these small to mid-sized chains that will lead you to the larger chains. If I heard it once, I heard it probably 20 times at the past three shows that I've been at, and that's the Craft and Hobby Show, the NAMTA, the National Art Material Show, and Houseware Show, is people are using Facebook to sell their product, to build their following, to drive their brand, as well as Instagram and all that. So all those will help you refine your retail skills that will push you into 
developing better sourcing and supply chain management. They will push you into controlling your finances and being able to plan for larger production runs going forward. So by all means, please take advantage of, you almost have to have a strategy for every retail segment. And that was one of the things that when I spoke to this company earlier today is they're already in retail, but they want to expand it. So they need to have a retail strategy for the Tuesday mornings, the home goods, the TJ Maxx's. They need to have a retail strategy for just the mass retailers like the Michaels, the Hobby Lobbies. Then they need to have a department store strategy for Kohl's and Dillard's and Macy's and then a luxury strategy. And so the strategy is positioning of the product and pricing, I'm assuming? Exactly. But also part of positioning is how you're branding it. Yeah, in terms of the labeling, the messaging, where the product's going to be positioned, you can negotiate for that too, is, can't you? Right, yes. There is a lot to this, which is why people need you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so you're clearly working with some very well-established accounts. Some of our people who are listening are smaller yet. Are there people like you for some of the smaller businesses who can help guide and consult someone along? Where would someone go if they want to know more? If you're in the craft and hobby business, the CHA organization. So the membership. Yes, definitely. Small Business Administration does quite a bit of great consulting and a lot of what they offer is free. Partner with your best customer. And through their own network, they can get you in touch with other consultants that can help you build your business. And so how else, I mean, one of the things that we talked about in terms of understanding all of this, well, we've talked about two now. We've talked about watching the trends, watching what's popular so that you have a product that someone would be interested in in the first place. So you can do that online. You can do that in shows. And then for added learning, what we've just talked about, go to the organizations of your industry, such as CH, I keep still calling it CHA, even though it's called AFCI. AFCI yes. now. Give his listeners, I'll link to this in the show notes. And the Small Business Association too, I'll link in. Are there any other things that you could think of that you would suggest in terms of getting information specifically on this? Are there any books about this or something else that you can think of off the top of your head, Bob, that you would suggest? All the books that I refer to are just basically general sales books. So it really wouldn't necessarily apply. I would have to say that there's got to be some books out there. If not, then I need to get busy with my pen and pencil and putting something down. Yeah, you do. <laughs> there may be something open right there for you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would deserve that because you've given us so much great information. That way, if that was the idea that was founded here, that would be really good. Yes. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> now, Bob, I would like to offer you to Dare to Dream. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It might even be a candle. I don't know. But it's a magical <laughs> box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside your box? So this is one of my most favorite questions that you could ask of me. Being in sales and consulting, I tend to think of myself as a dreamer and I help companies on a regular basis enhance or brainstorm on new products and ideas and things. My goal would be to create my own brand. Oh, wow. My own product line and get it out to the retailers and do something that's unique and something that's not just a me too, not another Chevron to throw out. I've always been in product development. I feel that this is the next stage in my progression. I was not expecting this, Bob, but I love it. <laughs> I love it. Do you have some thoughts already? We're obviously not going to ask you what they are, but are you like, is your mind going? It's going. I've brought on two people that are going to help me. And you met them at the Craft and Hobby Show. Right. So there's an ulterior plan here. Yes, this has been a, a plan. Again, it's strategic. 
it's something that it's definitely a goal and we've got our metrics and everything to make sure it all happens and where there's a plan, there's a way. Does it have anything to do with bees? <laughs> <laughs> kind of in a way. Oh, honey. Yep, we're, we're looking at some natural product. Yes. Oh, that's got my mind spinning now. That is so exciting, Bob. I loved hearing that. And really with your experience of knowing both sides of this business and what it entails to actually create and manufacture and then be able to sell product in mass, you've got all the knowledge behind you. I sure hope so. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> very exciting. Very, very exciting. Well, behalf on myself and the listeners, we wish you so much luck with that. And we're going to be following you all about that. That's for sure. <laughs> I've truly enjoyed this, Sue. This has been probably the highlight of the year for me. So thank you so much for including me on this. You are so sweet. Thank you. Well, I was thrilled. We talked about doing this back in January when we were talking yes. about the show because I'd been mentioning, you know, a lot of people have asked about wholesale and getting into these larger chains. And I knew exactly who would have the goods and you have delivered them here today, Bob. So thank you so, so much for joining me. It is my pleasure completely. Have a good day. You too. Well, this was definitely a treat hearing everything from Bob about how to expand our products into an entirely different arena, if we so choose. It's also your lucky day because I'm going to give you a little peek into next week's show, and it is going to be entirely different than what you would have expected in the past. As I've been talking about for a while now, my book is coming out in just a couple of weeks. And next week's show, I'm going to read from that book. I'm going to give you the introduction and then a couple of chapters from the book. I cannot wait to share it with you. And that's all up next week on Gift Biz Unwrapped. I'll see you there. This episode is all wrapped up, but fortunately, your gift biz journey continues. Are you eager to learn more? Our gift biz gal has a free download just for you. Head over to giftbizunwrapped.com slash 12 steps to get your copy of the 12 steps to starting a profitable gift biz. Don't delay. Head over to giftbizunwrapped.com slash 12 steps today. And until next time, happy business crafting.